Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the question of whether or not the right books are in the Bible in our continuing study of apologetics. There's a term that the Greeks used. Actually, it, it translated pretty much the same way in Hebrew as well. The word was kanon, and, and you can say it in Greek, kanon, or you can say uh, uh, kane in, in Hebrew. It sounds very much the same. Uh, and it describes a, a ruler uh, that is a measuring rod. It had to be unbendable. It had to be dependable as to its straightness. And that term, kanon, gave rise to what we call Canonicity. From canonicity, from again from canon, has it it actually refers to the church's recognition of the authority of the inspired writings. So that when we speak of the canonical writings, we're talking about those writings that are the authority for the church. If we're talking within Christianity, if we're talking within Judaism, we'd we'd be speaking of the uh, the books that our Jewish friends re refer to as authoritative. Uh, so we can talk about the Jewish canon or the Christian canon, but canonicity then refers to the church's recognition of those writings. Now, we're going to look at both the Old Testament, the books of the Old Testament, and the books of the New Testament, but we have to remember that these were not all written at the same time. Uh, the Old Testament was completed around 400 BC, uh, and New Testament not until after the the, the the birth, the life, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, so a good 400 years separate the two. And so first we'll look at the Old Testament, and then we'll look at the development of the New Testament canon. Our Jewish friends had a book, had a phrase. Um, they still have this phrase. I think it, it is is still with us. Uh, the uh, the matma uh, yadeim, the books which def and th that term refers to the defiling of the hands. Uh, when you first hear it, you think, well, uh, these touching these books makes you unclean. No, it, it's actually just the opposite. It's that you are. Uh, your hands might be unclean, and so you wash them if you were going to touch these books because they are so holy, they are so special, they are um, assumed to have been from God. In other words, it was their term, their way of describing those books that were authoritative, those books which had authority. And and there were lots of other books that, that the Jew, Jewish people knew about, even books that were written by Jewish people, but these books were special because they were deemed to have been from God. So uh, these were called as books which defile the hands. There's actually uh, this phrase used in the Tosefta uh, Yadaim, uh, that is one of the chapters of the Mishnah that speak of the gospel. Now, when they when they're referring to the gospel, they're talk, actually talking about the the New Testament. Uh, remember, our Jewish friends did not accept, by and large, the New Testament. And so they say the, the gospel and the books of the heretics, um, I think they're lumping the, the, the Christians with the heretics, do not make the hands unclean. The books of Ben Sirah, this was a, uh, a book written, or a series of books written after the, the Old Testament had been completed uh, by other uh, Jewish writers. The books of Ben Sirah and whatever books have been written since his time are not canonical. Uh, so notice the Jews made a distinction between those books that were authoritative, what we call the Old Testament, they call their scriptures. Uh, th those would be the books which defile the hands. And then other books, they might be good books, might not, uh, but th these, these books, uh, that wasn't an issue because they weren't considered to be holy. Now, if we look at a timeline, Notice um, I'm, I'm going all the way up to the year, there's no year zero, so I'm going from 500, 400, 300, 200, 100, and then the year one. Uh, and then after that, we begin the year of our Lord. You know, We say AD, Anno Domino, 200. And right now, as I'm uh, putting this together, we're in the year 2022. Um, but the Old Testament was completed then around 400 B.C., um, um, now, it had, it had begun being written much, much earlier than that. Uh, I take parts of it to have been written by Moses going back around 1400 BC, so uh, a thousand years earlier. And then over that period, the, the Old Testament is written, and then it's complete. Um, and around 250 BC, we have a translation, this is the first translation that we know of, made of the, of the Old Testament Hebrew into, in this case, into Greek. Uh, 
Notice the LXX, that's the Roman numeral 70. That's known as the Septuagint, which is just the Greek term for 70. Uh, and that translation was made in Alexandria, e e uh, Alexandria Egypt. That was a Greek city uh, founded by Alexander the Great, who had lived a century earlier. And it was here that the translation of the Hebrew Bible was made into Greek at the orders, or at least during the reign of, uh, Ptolemy II. He was one of those Greek kings. His, his uh, father had been a general under Alexander the Great. And then he came to power and he built this great library at Alexandria. Uh, so um, the Library of Alexandria was um, made it its goal to collect all of the books in the world, at least copies. <laughs> There's a funny little story where they would, uh, a ship coming into port at Alexandria, they would search them not for drugs, but they would search them for books. And if there were any books that were found, they would actually confiscate it, copy the book, and then give the ship back the copy, and they would keep the original. Well, when it came to the Bible, um, the Greeks couldn't read Hebrew, and they wanted a copy of this book that was deemed holy by the Jewish people, so they had it translated into Greek. And the story goes that there were 70 translators, and so um, it was called then the 70, or the we say the Septuagint. So 70 Jewish scholars were involved in translating it, and they eventually translated the entire, what we call the Old Testament, what, what they called the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, they translated it, and eventually they also included, now we haven't got to what the Apocrypha is, uh, because initially the books of the Apocrypha had not yet been written. They're not going to be added until a bit later, so let's go back to our timeline. We're back to our timeline. We've got the Old Testament completed, uh, the Septuagint. The New Testament is going to be written, of course, after the coming of Jesus. Um, but, you know, it's, it's after his death, burial, resurrection, and, and then a few years uh, pass, and we begin to have both epistles and the gospel accounts. And the New Testament is completed in that first century, in the first century A.D., now, I mentioned the Apocrypha, the, what we call the Old Testament Apocrypha. There's going to be a New Testament Apocrypha, too. Uh, but the Old Testament Apocrypha uh, is written around, and you know, I'm, I'm being very broad in these dates, but from around 200 B.C. to a bit after 100 B.C. Um, and there's a number of books that make that up. Actually, if you go to the Roman Catholic Church and you look in one of their Bibles, you'll see, I think it's around 11 uh, apocryphal books. Uh, go down to the Church of Ethiopia, and they'll actually have quite a few, uh, a few more apocryphal books, um, in, including, in their case, both Old Testament apocrypha, but also books that, are, that come after the New Testament. So they've actually got a, a bigger collection. And we'll, we'll talk about those books. Um, and then just to finish up, uh, notice um, beginning after the New Testament has been written, but into the second century, you have what are called the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, we would now this doesn't mean they necessarily knew the apostles, um, although I think that's why the term has been given. Uh, some of them either knew. Really, I think the idea there is that they were the next generation after the apostles. They were trying to carry on the teachings of the apostles, and we actually have some some writings, some usually epistles, that are written uh, from them, um, and, and they have been saved, and we can, we can read them, uh, although they will make a distinction. They'll, they'll say, um, look, the, there was Jesus, and there were the apostles, and they were very special, and, but we're, we're not that special. So you listen to what they had to say, and we're trying to tell you what they had to say, um, but don't, you, know, you don't have to think of us as being super special or, or what we're writing as having the same sort of authority. They actually made that kind of distinction. Now, Josephus, we're still dealing with the, the Old Testament right now. Josephus is a first century historian. He was actually an eyewitness to the fall of Jerusalem in the year 70 uh, AD. Um, but in this uh, writing, he's writing a, a, a writing called Contra Appion. He's writing to somebody named Appion who had written some nasty things about the Jewish people, and he's setting the record straight. And he says, we, speaking of we Jewish people, have not an innumerable multitude of books among us, disagreeing from and contradicting one another as the Greeks have, but only 22 books which contain the records of all the past times, which are justly believed to be divine. Now, he's speaking of the Old Testament. You say, wait a minute, the Old Testament has 39 books in it. Well, you know, what happened to the other books? <laughs> well, uh, the Jewish people back then and even today count their, the books of the Old Testament a little differently than, than we do. Um, they 
take, for example, the Minor Prophets, there's 12 of them, they, they refer to that as one book and they call it the 12. So it's the same books, but it's just numbered differently. And the same thing happens where they have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. They don't include those First and Seconds. They, each one of those is just one book. And they take Ezra and Nehemiah and put it together into one book. So uh, when you consolidate like that, you come up with exactly the same books that we have in our Old Testament are in the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, they put them in a different order and count them differently, but it's exactly the same books. Josephus goes on to say, in, in the next line, he says, it is true our history has been written since Artaxerxes. Now, Artaxerxes was the, the Persian emperor around the time, 400 BC, around the time that the, um, the Old Testament was completed. He says it's been written since then, very particularly, but has not been esteemed of the like authority with the former by our forefathers, because there has not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. So Josephus is saying, look, the, there were prophets and they were writing, and they, their writings were deemed to have come um, speaking the voice of God, uh, but then the prophets stopped. And because they stopped, we said, well, th there's other people writing after this, um, but they don't have the same authority because the prophets stopped. And so uh, even some of those books talk about the stopping of the prophets. Um, um, some of those, and I'm not going to go into each one. I've actually got a separate class somewhere uh, where we go through the Apocrypha. Um, one of those books, the, um, the Book of Maccabees, and there's several books of Maccabees, but they, that actually tells the story of a Jewish civil war, not civil war, a war for independence against, uh, against some Greek conquerors. Uh, that takes place uh, around 168, 166 BC, um, and it and it's good history, and it's not only is it good history, it's important history because the New Testament writers assumed that you were familiar with that story, just like you might be familiar with American history or or history of whichever country you have come from. Um, it was it was their story, so they knew that history, and they and they knew the Book of Maccabees. It was a good book, but they didn't consider it to have the same authority. That's what Josephus is saying right here. We have to specify, though, that the existence of the canon does not equal the recognition of the canon. You see, uh, I believe that the books of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, we haven't gotten to the New Testament yet, that they were authoritative as, as soon as they were written. But not everyone immediately realized that in every case. And so at certain times, we're going to see a little bit of a gap from the time it's written uh, to the time where, well, first of all, it has to be distributed. Remember, they didn't have copy machines back then, so every copy had to be hand copied uh, and then, then distributed and finally recognized uh, in the case of the Old Testament by, by our Jewish friends, in the case of the New Testament by the church. Um, and that, that took some time in both cases. Now, I want to turn to the New Testament canon, um, and I ought to start by just saying the New Testament was born with a completed canon already in its hands. We just saw that. Uh, they had the Hebrew Scriptures. That was the Bible that Jesus used. That was the Bible that the New Testament people, uh, Paul the Apostle, Peter, all the Apostles, that was the Bible they knew and had. But in addition to that, now we're going to see some other writings, writings from the apostles, or in certain cases, people deputized by the apostles, uh, where they write and the books that eventually become what we call our New Testament. Um, the New Testament books were all completed, I believe, in the first century. I think there's good evidence for that. Uh, folks that want to you know, make that a little bit later, I think, are, are, are walking on very um, very uneven ground, because um, by the next generation or two, you're going to have people quoting from the New Testament. You can't be quoting from it if it hasn't been written yet. So they had all been completed in the first century. Um, but, but it's true that the copying and distribution of those books take a bit longer, and it doesn't always proceed at the same rate. Remember that the New Testament was written, but it had not been collected into a single volume. Uh, Paul, for example, writes an epistle to the Romans. Well, if there's going to be any other copies of the epistle of the Romans, and there would be because it has come down to us, uh, the people in Rome had to take that and copy it and make copies and, and begin to distribute them to other places besides just Rome. And so uh, that takes time. And remember, every copy has to be hand copied, and that was a very expensive and time-consuming procedure. But but it did take you know it did take place. Now most books were immediately accepted as authoritative, 
Um, remember, most of those books uh, were written to a an audience in the church. Um, the Gospels, I think, were written to very with with target audiences in mind, uh, and they they were immediately accepted uh, as authoritative by the church. Uh, likewise, the epistles, as they began to be written and distributed, now some of the epistles are are sort of personal letters. That's going to take a little bit longer. Is is just is is this just a a personal note, for example, to Timothy or to Titus, or is this really for the eyes of the larger church? And there's a little bit of a question mark. Um, but most books were immediately accepted as authoritative, there's, we're going to see that there were a few books that took a little bit longer, and we'll look at, at, at the question why that took place. Uh, secondly, other, began, other writings began to appear um, by the end of the first century and into the second century, we began to have other write, other Christian writings uh, and some writings that maybe weren't quite so Christian, but at least uh, uh, speaking of Jesus and things like that, we're gonna t- going to look at those. And they began to appear after the New Testament. And of course, the question comes up, you know, do these have any authority? Uh, what do we do about these? Uh, writings, for example, of the, Apostle, uh, the Apostolic Fathers. And they made it really easy because the Apostolic Fathers said, look, the Apostles, they're the ones that you need to listen to. We are just writing to say, listen to them, and we're, we're trying to repeat and apply some of their teachings, but we're not coming up with anything new. Uh, we, you know, we're, we don't have new revelation from God. No, we're, we're actually basing our letters on what they wrote. And so they actually pointed to what we call the New Testament, said, read that. Um, uh, there's a book called the Didache, just means the teachings. Uh, the, I think the full title is something like the teachings of the apostles. Um, and um, this was a, I guess you could describe it as a new Christian's manual. And it, it's, again, taken from the teachings of the New, New Testament, but just tries to be very practical in its approach, um, was not considered to be uh, authoritative in the sense, um, in the same sense uh, that the Old Testament or even the New Testament was. Um, and then after this, you have the writings of the early church fathers, uh, the generations that come after the apostolic fathers, who themselves came uh, in the that they were the generation or two after the apostles. So these are or later people that are writing, and and uh, we have a great deal that's written from the early church fathers. Uh, I actually teach a class on uh, on church history, and we we look at a lot of those writings. Uh, But then you begin to have some other (laughs) writers as well. Uh, For example, Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a, a second century cult and some of these folks are writing, and they're actually some of them are actually trying to write pretend gospels, um, the Gospel of Thomas, which wasn't written by Thomas, and uh, shows very uh, a lot of evidence of, of been being written sometime later. Uh, but it's, th- those are, and, and when you read them, they're sort of goofy and immediately obvious to a Christian. Well, uh, gee, that's just weird. Um, and they're trying to pass off their teachings as though they had been written in an earlier age. Uh, so, uh, Gnostic writers and, and other writing, writers that begin to write things. And, and sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're not bad at all. So, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, a neat little uh, uh, series of writings called Thecla. Uh, Thecla was a, a woman who supposedly lived going back all the, way, uh, all the way back to the days of the Apostle Paul. Now, this wasn't written by her, it's written about her, uh, talking about this woman who was faithful. And it, it almost like reads uh, like a Christian biography or maybe a novel, I'm not sure uh, how accurate it is. But it, it has some nice stories and, and other stories of martyrs and things like that that, that are written and passed around. Now, we, we mentioned some of the false teachers. Marcion is a good example of this. Uh, Marcion was in the second century. He was a teacher who wanted to try to teach that the Old Testament God was a bad God and the New Testament God is a good God. And so he put together his own copy of the Bible. Uh, he didn't like the Old Testament, so he threw that out. Uh, and then he took 10 of the epistles of Paul, but took out all the places where Paul talks about the Old Testament and and cut them out. Well, <laughs> you're, you're going to have much smaller epistles. And then he took the Gospel of Luke and he took all the parts he didn't like out of that. And so he came out with his his basically his own Bible. And um, but it was all cut up and things like that. Um, but notice he was trying to base it on things that he wasn't. You know, it's funny because it, it's a little bit like a counterfeit. Nobody counterfeits. A, a $6 bill, because there's no such thing as a $6 bill. People always try to counterfeit that which is real, and Marcin was trying to do the same thing. And he's going to get called out on it by some of the early church fathers for doing exactly that. 
Now, here's the testimony of Irenaeus. Irenaeus is at the end of the second century, um, one of the early church fathers. He says, there is such certainty surrounding the Gospels that the heretics themselves bear witness to them. That is, when he says the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament, the, the, these are the books that talk about Jesus and, and the life of Jesus, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He, and notice the heretics themselves bear witness to them, and starting from the Gospels, each one of them attempts to establish his own doctrine. The Ebionites, uh, using only the Gospel of Matthew, are confuted by it when they make false assumptions concerning the Lord. Uh, uh, the Ebionites wanted to say, well, Jesus was just a, a, a good teacher, uh, but he wasn't anything more than that. <laughs> well, the Gospel of Matthew actually contradicts that, and, and they, they pointed to that to try to make it say that, but it, but it really didn't. He goes on to say Marcion, who we mentioned earlier, Marty, Marcion, who mutilates that of Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, is proved a blasphemer of the only existing God by those parts that are still retained. You know, even though he, he cut out part the parts he didn't like, he didn't cut out enough. <laughs> and, and it still declared him to be wrong and in error. Those who follow Valentine, this was another false teacher in the second century, uh, making copious use of the Gospel of John to illustrate their conj uh, conjugation, uh, that is, um, their, they were trying to, to uh, use the Gospel of John to try to push their own brand of false teaching, will by that very Gospel be proven uh, proved to have and said nothing rightly. Uh, so even, <laughs> even the false teachers were giving credit to the right Gospels by trying to use those in a wrong way. Now, you have what's known then as the homologumena. These are the books, the, 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 the homo part is accepted by all. These are the books accepted by everybody. These books were basically unquestioned by people in the church, out of the church. Everybody agreed that these were recognized by Christians to have authority. Uh, the four Gospels, the book of Acts, the epistles of Paul, uh, 1 Peter, and 1 John, which that's most of the New Testament. But there were a few books that were known as the anti-legomena, uh, these are the books that were questioned by some people. Not everybody questioned these, but there was a question mark, at least by some people. Now, Hebrews was one of those because Hebrews doesn't tell you the name of the author. And they thought, well, who's, <laughs> who's, who's the author of it? Um, now, it sounds a bit like Paul, um, and I think whoever wrote it was connected to Paul, um, although the Greek is a little bit different, so maybe he was writing through a secretary who sort of put it into his own words. Um, not, not quite sure. The readers of Hebrews knew who it was, but but the author's name wasn't mentioned in the text. It was it's like when you get a text from a friend and he might not give his name on the text. It was a little bit like that. Uh, there was James. Um, that's the that short epistle um, by James, and people ask, well, which James is that? And uh, really, sort of sounds like somebody who's. Uh, it mentions Jesus twice, but only in passing, and it sounds a lot like somebody, like a Jewish person, even talks about when, when someone comes into your synagogue, uh, is that really a Christian document? I think it is, uh, but people questioned it. Uh, Second Peter, I'm not sure why the questioning, except maybe it was, it's on the short side and maybe hadn't been uh, distributed quite as evenly. Uh, second and Third John and Jude were questioned because they're very short. Second, third John almost read like postcards instead of epistles. Uh, and Jude is, is only one chapter. Um, and then the book of Revelation, I think, was questioned mostly because people were trying, they scratched their heads and they said, look at all those symbols and there's a dragon there and and the beast and and lampstands and uh, a lion of the tribe of Judah. What, what do all those things mean? And so I think they puzzled over its meaning and wondered about that. Um, so these were books that, that some people questioned. And so most of the New Testament, no problem. Uh, some books people questioned at least for a time, uh, maybe because of distribution and, or maybe because of content. Uh, but they were, there was a period of questioning. Now, the antilegomena, and here the term is actually used by Eusebius. He's an early church historian. He says, among the disputed writing, and that, that's actually the term he's using there is uh, tone uh, uh He's a actually using the term there in a sentence, which are nevertheless recognized by many. So he says the antilegomena, um, some people question, but a whole lot of other people don't question. Um, they're recognized by many or uh, extent the so-called epistle of James and that of Jude and also the second epistle of uh, Peter and those that are called the second and third of John, whether 
they belong to the evangelist or to another person of the same name. In other words, who wrote those? Was that John the Apostle, John the Evangelist, John of somebody else? Uh, which John was that? John was a very common name back then, just like it is today. He goes on to say, among the rejected writings, it must be reckoned, now, now he's not talking about the antilogomena that are rejected by some. These are books that are rejected by a whole lot more people. Among the rejected writings must be reckoned also the Acts of Paul and the so-called Shepherd, that's the Shepherd of Hermas, which is sort of a strange book, um, but written qu quite a, lo a long time later. Uh, and the Apocalypse of Peter. Now, that, notice there was a different Apocalypse. Um, and in addition to these, the extant Epistle of Barnabas. Now, the Epistle of Barnabas, um, actually, um, we it, it's an epistle that's written from the church at Rome to the church of, of the Corinthians. Um, but it, it's written later on uh, after the New Testament had already been written. Not a, not a bad epistle. It's just telling them, uh, hey, listen, you've been doing some things wrong. You need to straighten up your action. And, and what it says is good. Uh, he goes on to say, and the so-called teachings of the apostles. Now, uh, that's the Didache. That's, remember, we talked about that, that already. And besides, as I said, the apocalypse of John, if it seems proper with some, as I said, reject, but which others class with the accepted books. So notice he comes uh, down to the Apocalypse of John. That's what we call the book of Revelation. And he says, the people are still scratching their heads over that one. Uh, but these others, everybody agrees, they should not be uh, part of the what we call the scriptures, part of the New Testament. Now, in closing, and I'm sure there's areas we can come back to and revisit, but in closing, I want to talk about a a novel that came out. Now, this is a work of fiction. Not, it's not actually a historical book, um, but it was very popular in its day. It came out quite a number of years ago by Dan Brown called The Da Vinci Code, and some claims were made in it, and and there was a little notation at the beginning of the book that almost want to make you think that he's actually basing some of these things on fact. Uh, they were not. Uh, he says in the he has one of the characters say in the book that Constantine chose the books of the Bible and ordered other non-canonical books to be burnt. Well, that that's wrong on every account. First of all, um, the <laughs> most of the books of the New Testament and all the books of the Old Testament were already. Uh, understood to be authoritative. They, they had had some questions about a few books. Uh, Constantine was not involved in any of that, uh, pro or con. Um, he, he, was, he was there at the Council of Nicaea, but at the Council of Nicaea, they didn't talk about which books go in the Bible. That, that wasn't even an issue. Um, and he didn't order other non-canonical books to be burned. That didn't happen either. Um, in, in fact, a lot of those non-canonical books have, have come down to us, uh, copied by people in the, in the church. Um, it, there's a claim made in, again, one of the characters who's supposed to be smart and, and a historian uh, says in the book that the Gospels were edited after the Council of Nicaea. That simply didn't happen. Um, now, Constantine did order 50 copies of the Bible to be made, but they were they were going to be copied by by official state sponsored scribes and and we actually uh, I think possibly have one or two of those um, that are passed down to us. They're very very uh, well written and carefully inscribed and great handwriting. Remember they didn't have the printing press back then. Uh, but there's no editing that's there. Uh, that certainly didn't take place. Uh, they, now they were doing the best they could because sometimes you know anytime somebody copies. Uh, a long a long work by hand from from one medium to another, typos are going to creep in. And, and that sort of thing did take place. That's another topic that we will address in another lecture. But there was no editing that was going on. Um, and then the claim is made that the Gnostic Gospels are older than the four canonical Gospels. That's just a lie. I don't know uh, what prompted him to even say such a thing. Uh, that's, that's simply not true. And is easily demonstrated by the fact that you have people quoting the canonical Gospels by the second century, um, and uh, Gnostic Gospels, everybody agrees, is they don't begin to appear until the, the second century. Uh, so that's that's simply not true. And um, in closing, it was uh, interesting. I had I remember having a conversation right after, uh, I think there was a movie made of uh, Down Brown's book, and right after the movie came out, I was uh, happened to be somewhere speaking to a... a um, a professor of American history, and uh, he said, uh, "Aren't you Christians worried about uh, Dan Brown? You know, this movie about Brown and and all of these 
comments that have been made with regard to the Bible. And I said, well, no, not really. It was it was fiction. Uh, and then I turned to him. Let me just ask you, are you really worried about the movie National Treasure uh, with Nicolas Cage, where there's a, a map on the back of the Declaration of Independence? And I and I answered myself. It was a rhetorical question. I said, of course, you're not. It was a fictional movie. And they just made things like that up. Um, and the same thing happened in this book and in other books that have sought to attack and undermine undermine the Bible. Um, they're they're fictional accounts, and they they might be entertaining stories, but that's all they are. The Bible continues to stand firm. <laughs>